All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, we're gonna get started here. We're gonna start with a few housekeeping items as you all are joining in. Um, all of you will be muted upon your entry to the webinar. Um, we ask that you submit your any questions that you have in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat. Um, and we will be reviewing that during the course of the webinar. Um, and ideally, we're going to keep questions until the end. But if we see a, a relevant question pop up um, at a particular time and we feel like it's appropriate to address it, then we will do that. Also wanted to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and that you will be getting a copy of that recording after the webinar. So you can always go back and refer to something if need be. Once again, thank you all for joining us. My name is Ashling Earhart. I'm the chair of our firm's Title IX practice group. Um, I conduct investigations for colleges and universities in the Title IX space, and I also serve as an advisor to complainants as well as respondents who are going through the Title IX process. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and I am a big fan of informal resolution, so happy to present with you today. I also have with me Allison and Sydney, if you could introduce yourselves as well. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Allison Wisniewski, uh, pronouns she and her. I'm our campus dean of students and Title IX coordinator, and I've been doing Title IX work for many years, and I am also a fan of informal uh, resolution. I think um, the information we provide today will really help in um, making this an option for your students. And hi, I'm Sydney smith Forecare. I work with Ashling at the same law firm, and along with her, I also um, act as an investigator for institutions and also represent parties through the process. And I see, I am sure you've seen the theme that we are all very pro informal resolution and hopefully this presentation will help you see why. So to go ahead and get started, um, what are the basics? What is informal resolution? So it's generally going to be an agreement between the parties involved in either Title IX or a sexual harassment or misconduct type policy. Generally, we're gonna go through some pros and cons, but um, just the initial pros, it can allow parties a more active say in the outcome of the process itself. It can save time and resources, and it can also avoid the lengthy, lengthy uh, process and potential re-traumatization that can happen by going through and having to speak about the events um, continuously in the investigation and in the formal hearing. So pros, we just talked about a couple of them, but let's get a little bit more into it. Um, so it can save time and resources, like we said, that's both for the students, the parties, and the institutions. Um, and it can avoid legal fees, both for the parties and the institutions, if advisors are attorneys, and it also, um, after a decision is made, if it is one that one of the parties is not happy with, there always could be um, legal considerations for the institution that they're going to have to deal with that informal resolution could potentially help and mitigate. More importantly, though, um, informal resolution is much more party and student centered than the formal process in that sometimes a party, a complainant especially, has something they want out of the Title IX process that the formal process doesn't necessarily contemplate all of the time. Sometimes those are um, unusual non-sanctioned uh, non like actions or um, some other result that maybe the school isn't able to give. And we're gonna go into some of those in a little bit more detail later. But the informal resolution allows not only for them to have a little bit more say in what they want to see at the end of the process, but if the respondent is willing and able to agree to some of those items, it means that the process can stop right there. The complainant can hopefully get what they're looking for and what would help them and they avoid having to go back through what I'm sure you're all aware is a very lengthy investigation and then a very lengthy hearing process that can be very um, upsetting for both parties and those involved. Um, and it reduces stress because of the fact that it can shorten that process and allow students to focus on helping themselves and then helping their education as well. There are some cons, however. Um, of course, parties will not feel like they get their you know, so-called day in court. There might be um, someone that really wants to be able to speak about their feelings and their thoughts and what occurred to them um, in front of a hearing panel. There may be someone that wants to defend themselves publicly in the same way or in front of a hearing panel. 
Um, and so not having that hearing can be something that parties are not willing to give up um, in certain instances. And parties are also sometimes not likely to want to work together or to communicate even through a third party together. And so because of that, you know, there are ways to work to make it a positive process for everyone, even if they're in those situations. And we'll talk about that later. But it can be a con, especially in starting the informal resolution process. So Ashling is going to tell us a little bit about the history of informal yes, resolution. And to, to those of you who have been in this field for a long time, you're most likely familiar with this. But to those who are newer, like just wanted to give a little bit of a background um, of informal resolution and what it's looked like through the years. So before the current regulations, um, informal resolution was not required as part of the Title IX process. So some schools did offer it in a non-mediation kind of based informal res resolution process, um, but there was guidance from the department uh, that said that mediation was not appropriate in cases involving allegations of sexual assault. Um, so that's that was a big change, um, you know, going into the, the new regs. So we see currently, the current regulations say that an institution may offer informal resolution once a formal complaint with the school is filed. And that really is the key defining moment. You have to have that formal complaint has to have been filed with the school in order for informal resolution to even come into existence as a possibility. There are three requirements for entering into that process. The parties have to be provided with written notice um, and the, the parties must voluntarily consent to entering into that informal resolution process. It's good to get good practice to get that in writing, to get the, the parties to sign that, make sure that they understand you know, that they're entering into this process and that you have that documented um, that they're doing so voluntarily. The only instance under the current regulations in which parties may not participate in the informal resolution process is if an uh, employee is being accused by a student of sexual harassment. So that's the only time in which informal resolution is not permitted under the current regs. Anticipated changes. I know all of us are waiting with bated breath to receive these the new regulations um, supposed to have been handed down in October of this year. Looks like that's gonna be 2024. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Um, I'd say the, the biggest change um, is going to be if these if the current wording is enacted as anticipated, that second bullet point there. So we're not going to need the, the formal complaint to be first filed in order to you know, even think about or consider the informal resolution process. I don't know about Allison and Sydney, but I like this. Um, sometimes you know, students come in, they don't want to engage in the formal process. They don't want to file a formal complaint, but there are certain things that they want. Um, so I like that this is, it's creating a dialogue right from the beginning, as opposed to forcing the, the student to, to file that formal complaint. Um, so we're getting, you know, we're getting to better understand and communicate with the, with the student, with the complainant, what he or she is looking for, um, and able to initiate that. Um, and of course, you know, un under those, the, the anticipated changes, you're still going to have to provide notice. Um, to the parties. And another thing, which is also great, is to ensure that the facilitator of the informal resolution process cannot be the same as the investigator or decision maker. Um, so a lot of times we think informal resolution and we think, oh, well, that's something that parties decide at the beginning of a case what they want to do. Not so. I mean, I've, I've had cases that go to informal resolution after a hearing um, and before a decision is handed down. And so there are, you know, it really runs the gamut time wise. Um, so we don't want someone who has served as the hearing officer to then be serving as the facil facilitator for informal resolution. That just doesn't make sense. And so the anticipated changes to the, the regulations, um, they, they call that out as well. So the big piece of informal resolution is that it's voluntary. And um, in Title IX coordinator practice, this is a, an area where I think a lot of folks sometimes will talk about it in the very beginning and sometimes not. And I'll talk more about when to initiate those conversations, but it is voluntary for the student. And so 
if you kind of think about how students sort of drive the process, right, the, the uh, complaining party drives the process, this is part of those decision um, points for them. So this statement is from the, um, the regs and you read through and you're like, what exactly does that mean? Um, and so it means that it's a voluntary remedy-based structured interaction between um, the two parties or, or multiple parties that really balances the supportive measures that the institution may be providing and then also providing accountability without that formal piece of it where you would have a hearing and, and that kind of thing. Um, it is offered in various forms, um, generally really to allow for the respondent to acknowledge harm um, and accept responsibility in repairing harm to an extent possible. Um, and a lot of times, like Ash was uh, talking about, the student really wants to be heard uh, and maybe that formal process is not going to be um, worth their while at that point. Um, I will say that the other piece of informal resolution that's really important to say is that we are still eliminating prohibited conduct, uh, uh, preventing its recurrence and remedy the effects uh, with informal resolution um, and really looking at a, a community-based response to, to the, in, the instance, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I think our next slide. So the other the other thing here is that um, the options um, are a, an alternative process or maybe a restorative justice conference or a, com a combination of both. Um, and then once the formal complaint is filed like this here, we're going to have a, a notice that gets sent to both parties. One of the things I tell everyone is that, you know, document uh, and also have these things signed as, as you're moving through the process so that both parties have an opportunity to stop, reflect on what's going on and making sure that they have the ability to say, wait, this may not be for me. Um, so you could see here that your notice from the Title IX coordinators, your notice that has to be sent out must have this in there. Um, and sometimes we don't include this and that could cause a problem down the road when we're at the final stage of this, right? Um, let me see, I think that is it at this point. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yes, so next we're gonna just talk about quickly um, whether you are required to offer informal resolution. Ashling talked about a little bit um, how the Title IX regulations do require it if you're under a Title IX policy. But of course, um, many of you probably have institutions with secondary sexual harassment and misconduct policies whenever you have different um, jurisdictional concerns that don't neatly file, um, go under Title IX. Those policies, of course, are not actually um, regulated by the federal regulations. And so there's no requirement to offer informal resolution inside of those. We do see institutions that do not allow for informal resolution under their secondary or Part B policies. And if that is the case, um, sometimes it's because they're following former guidance and they just haven't updated those policies. Sometimes there is a choice behind that. But um, it is something to think about that it can be really confusing to parties, especially if they enter thinking they're going to be under the Title IX policies and then later on are told that they are actually under this other sexual misconduct policy and that informal resolution is no longer available to them. Um, that can be confusing to differentiate to them because sometimes it's just an off-campus versus on-campus issue. And it is um, typically going to be a better practice to try and have equal offerings between those two um, policies, especially for informal resolution. So how, how do we offer this to um, students that come forward and, and when? Um, I think that this is part of the dialogue when you're first meeting with a student that you offer all the options and you sort of lay them out for the student in an initial meeting. Um, I have been very successful in working with students when I provide a lot of information and then have a follow-up meeting to answer questions, um, knowing that the student coming forward has been a very traumatic event and they shouldn't be forced to make that decision um, right there and then. Um, once the student does make a decision, then it's the next part of this is to add that language into your documents that when you're sending things out, um, and sort of make sure 
um, that there's no additional questions. And then again, making sure that the notices agree to um, however you're doing. We use a DocuSign process that may be um, something that you may want to use. I've also done the let's print, you're in my office, we're going to print this and you're going to sign it. So there's multiple ways that you can do this. Um, things that are going out on email are also okay, but then I would all, I always ask my students, please respond to this email stating that you, you know, understand. Again, as Title IX coordinators, you want to make sure that you have something in your hand that says that both parties have received when they received it and they understand what's moving forward. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I think too, you know, communication is really the name of the game here. Um, but also an openness to really understanding what the parties want. Um, I had a case at a, a private university where the policy allowed for informal resolution. I was, you know, the advisor to the respondent in this particular case, and the respondent reached out to the Title IX coordinator to ask about informal resolution and got a very, you know, flippant, impatient kind of email back saying that, you know, that wasn't her role, you know, to facilitate that and and really kind of just shutting down any type of dialogue about informal resolution. Again, the policy allowed for it. It was something that the student, you know, wanted to explore. Um, you know, perhaps the complainant, you know, we we don't know what the complainant's response would have been. Um, but but again, as a Title IX coordinator who who is receiving information from a student about the informal resolution process, you know, don't don't freak out. You know, if it's not your job, find the person whose job it is. Like assign a new role. Um, you know, allow someone else to 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 deal with the informal resolution process. Again, you you just want to be answering students' questions and facilitating the the process to the extent that you can. Revisiting the well. This is a favorite topic of mine because, you know, as Allison said, when when parties first come in, be they complainant or respondent, it's overwhelming. You're meeting with a student, you're, you know, a student has gone through a situation as a complainant or, you know, the respondent as well, um, learning of these allegations, which, you know, the respondent may have characterized in a very different way. This is shocking. And so for a person to decide at the very outset whether, you know, they're going to go through, you know, the formal process with a hearing versus an informal process, I mean, it's just a lot to take in. Um, so like I said, I, I've had, you know, great experience um, at, at many different universities and colleges that, you know, they they build in these these reminders about informal resolution. And of course, if a party has an attorney advisor, you know, um, it, it's something that the attorney advisor is also suggesting. Um, you want to you want to be thinking about it. You want to ask. I've I've had cases where I never thought would be informally resolved because they were just so contentious between the parties. And at the end of the day, when you're actually facing a hearing or when you've gone through the hearing and realized that the decision is out of your hands, um, you know, maybe it's something then that you're ready to explore. And so really, I just I think it's it's good um, to to a good practice tip to consider building in reminders about informal resolution to the parties at various points during the process, not just at the very beginning. Um, I've had cases, you know, that that have resolved informally after one, two years, um, you know, so this is not something, again, that that's that's a quick uh, decision um, It's something that, you know, it's it's a work in progress, as we all are. And and I think that it's, it's something that that is good for for parties to consider at various stages of the process. The only other um, piece of this that I would um, say that we consider too is that the um, respondent has the ability in informal resolution to also ask for it. Um, and so depending on how your policy is structured or what um, supports you're giving to your respondent, this is also something that you can discuss with them. Um, there's been a few cases that I, I'm aware of that have ended in very successful, agreeable terms and it was because of the respondent said, I want an informal resolution and here's some things. And that was very um, consistent with what the complaint had wanted. So that's also something that you can think about as you're working with your students. Right. And so that 
goes into the next set of slides, which talks about, you know, communicating with advisors, because with the informal process, if the parties both do have advisors, you are going to be doing a lot of um, communicating directly with them. So for one thing you definitely want to do is you need to identify if there's any inequalities between the advisors. That's going to be most common if someone is represented by an attorney and someone is not. Um, in those instances, you may want to uh, give a little bit of guidance or additional suggestions to the advisor and the party that don't have an attorney involved, especially if it seems that one party is giving a lot more content to you about what they may be interested in, and the other party sounds like they may need um, some guidance about some ideas or to talk them through you know, what their goals are and how that can be turned into real terms uh, that could help them. So you'll definitely want to be um, just monitoring the situation throughout and seeing how those advisors are doing with um, communicating what the wants and the needs of their parties are. With that, there also can be difficult advisors, right? You can have some pretty contentious, aggressive people, but in most cases, they're going to be wanting to reach the same conclusion that you are. They're going to be wanting an agreement. And so you shouldn't see that most often. But if you are seeing someone that is difficult to deal with, maybe over the phone or over Zoom, maybe it makes more sense to move things to email and to move things to a written conversation where you can um, do track changes in a document and go through different points if you need to remove the personal element um, from the situation. Uh, however, again, that's not the typical situation. Most uh, advisors are wanting to help the parties get to a resolution because they've chosen to do informal resolution. Um, and you can also use those advisors to help you help the parties reach the resolution, right? So if a party is kind of uh, on the fence about whether or not something is, whether they would agree to something or whether there is more that they would like, their advisor can help them um, get to either uh, a middle ground or can help them decide whether or not what they're doing is in their best interest regarding reaching the end goal of that agreement. I think too, as an attorney advisor, it's easier for me to deal with an advisor um, for the other party who is also an attorney. Um, you know, for me, I've reached out, you know, on multiple occasions to the advisor for the other party in an attempt to reach um, in, an informal resolution deal, um, just to broach it, you know, hey, what, what's the world? Let me know what the world is, even after I've been told, you know, they're not interested. Um, and that's that's actually been very positive. All right, well, this is actually what what my my um, the complainant or the the respondent um, is interested in. And then it's really just creating that dialogue. So if if I'm speaking attorney to attorney. Um, advisor to advisor, to me, it, it's a little bit easier than, you know, speaking with mom, who's obviously emotionally invested um, in, in the result. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you have a choice as an institution as to whether or not, you know, you're assigning advisors who are, you know, students or faculty members, administrators um, versus an attorney, you know, maybe one of those you know, maybe one of the 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 things is you you think about who's on the other side. You know, does the other party have an attorney advisor, um, and does that matter? Is that something that that we should be um, assigning an, another attorney advisor to our our student? Um, all right. So, uh, uh, reaching a resolution. Um, what does this actually look like? What, what, the nitty gritty of it. Um, you know, there are many different options for who guides the process. Um, again, we spoke about in the beginning of the webinar, you know, parties are, are hesitant. A lot of times there's a no contact order in place. They can't speak directly to one another. Um, or if there's no contact, no, no contact order in place, they don't want to speak to one another to, to reach this deal. This is really where the advisors come in. Um, the Title IX coordinator can also serve as the go-between. I, I really like that model. Um, sometimes, you know, the even the advisors are are not on good terms, and and they would rather speak directly to the school to the Title IX coordinator. Um, so that that can certainly serve, you know, in that role or some other neutral option, you know, that your school likes to utilize. Um, you know, I, I've seen many different options um, in many different schools, and it really you need to decide what works best for you. You know, you'll you'll once you get a couple informal resolutions under your belt. You'll, you'll begin to understand 
um, you know, what the process is, what worked, what didn't really give that time to reflect on it for your particular institution um, so that you can best serve the students for, for the next case. Um, sanctions. So th there'll be a lot of talk, you know, what what are the terms going to be of this informal resolution? Um, should the school be suggesting certain certain terms? Um, restorative justice, what, what do those options look like? Um, you know, and, and then how to implement these things. Um, so, you know, a lot of times, again, it's like in real estate, it, it's about location, location, location. And, you know, in this, it's about communication, communication, communication. What do the parties want? Um, you know, I, I've had very contentious cases resolve informally when, you know, we learn, all right, well, what does the complainant want um, if I'm serving as the advisor to the respondent? You know, sometimes it's the complainant does not want the respondent to be a part of an athletic team anymore, you know, so that's going to mean the respondent will have to agree, you know, to not be on a team anymore. Um, maybe it's not going to a particular restaurant or venue in the same town where they both go to school um, and where the complainant works or is employed. Um, sometimes the complainant wants to require the respondent to go to counseling sessions. What does that look like? How many sessions? Who is it with? Is it with a licensed therapist? Does the therapist have to then report back to the school um, as to you know how the sessions went? whether the therapist think that thinks that further treatment is still necessary. I mean, these are the things that that you know we have dealt with um, and and you want to be thinking about, you know, as far as you know, if somebody comes to you and says, well, can you make a suggestion like what what can I seek here? Really, it's whatever the parties will agree to um, is what that's going to to look like. And so we really just have to have our ears open and be able to to best communicate between the parties. Um, in order to to reach that resolution informally. Um, I've also had some cases that have resolved um, with with payments of expenses, so medical expenses, counseling expenses, um, legal fees. Um, sometimes the, those are are things that, you know, if a complainant is asking for them and the respondent is willing to provide them, um, you know, that that's something that the school will certainly entertain. Um, and so again, with, with these, when, when we're talking through these, it's not just a matter of the complainant and the respondent reaching an agreement. You know, the school has to sign off on these agreements. And a lot of that times that means getting your general counsel involved, um, you know, getting the director of your Title IX group involved, you know, because you have to be able to sign off and approve um, what these informal resolutions look like. All right. Um, before I go into the supportive measures, there's a few things that I did want to say from the Title IX coordinator perspective. I see a couple of questions too that might be easier to, to handle. So I think there's a big difference between advisors and um, support folks during this process, just like they are during a formal. And um, you can have in, at your institution, you really should have two lists, right? Uh, a list of people that can handle the emotional trauma and the the um, getting ready for telling the story or hearing the story and, you know, that type of person. And then the folks that really know your policy and your procedures and can be uh, witty with the attorneys that are there, right? So that's the other, the other part of this. Um, in my practice, I provide those folks to both sides, right? That I've been doing that before guidance made those suggestions. And I and I think that one of the reasons that we're successful with informal is because of that. And so I highly encourage you to, to look at who's on your campus, um, that you can do a training, bring someone in to kind of talk through, work with your wellness um, or health services teams to, to maybe offer a, how do I be more trauma-informed when I'm working with a student and what things can I do as far as that support? And then definitely do a more formal um, what training for your policy so that when they're in there in those rooms and talking through, they're clear on what they can and cannot do. So two groups of people. Um, there was another question about, you know, can the Title IX coordinator sort of facilitate this? And the answer is most definitely, and you should. Um, I think that 
definitely when there is representation for both parties and they're having those kind of off-campus conversations, that's one part of it. But when you get back on campus and you have both students going through and having to agree, the coordinator needs to do that. And my advice is gonna be the same as it was a couple of slide decks before. Document everything, make sure that you're consistently asking if there's questions, do they understand what this means? Um, you ask for someone not to go to the library second floor. The library second floor is a really important part of your academic career in year three, maybe not now. And so how is that gonna impact you? So as the coordinator, you really need to take time to help the students think through what they're actually agreeing to. Um, so anyhow, it, the supportive measures piece, this is another part of this where I'm like, don't think that you can only do counseling and uh, you know, a no contact order. There are so many other ways in which we can support students going through this process. And notice I said students. Uh, you need to be providing supportive measures for, for both the complainant and the respondent. Um, counseling, obviously, work with your wellness center so that you have the ability to call someone and say, I'm going, we're going to be going through this. What can you offer? And there are some legalities around um, mandating counseling in, in higher ed that you, you should take a, a look at and also talk to your own uh, counsel on. Um, we have done some really amazing things in order to ensure that our students are able to get back on track with their academics and get to graduation. Um, that includes everything from if they're on campus, are we changing uh, their rooming or what building they're in to looking at their course schedule, what rooms are we, you know, pivoting temporarily to a hybrid type of thing um, for a semester. Um, are we looking for a campus escort? Is it a plain clothes officer that's escorting? Is it a, a peer that's going to do the escorting? parking, there's there's a, a list of, of things. I will share one thing with you, a, a, a sort of a case study. Uh, we had a student that was in um, humanities and very involved um, in a, a course that was, you know, a, a high level of participation rate. Uh, very amazing student. And um, they wanted to make sure that they were able to go and attend class. Um, the topic of the class was triggering for this individual student. And so we came up with a, an agreement, um, got consent to talk to the faculty member, and the student was able to you know, have something on their desk that would then indicate to the faculty member that they're there in the classroom, but they're not going to be talking. And the student was able to be in that moment, be a student, but not have to be verbally uh talking into in the discussion and was extremely successful in that um, way. So you, be creative in your supportive measures. Um, again, make sure that if you're going to be talking about the situation to those outside that you get the consent of your student as well. Um, you know, and then also make sure that that notice, that practice tip on the bottom that goes out in all your documentation. Okay. So the parties have agreed to enter into informal resolution. Let's talk about some considerations when that does occur. Um, first, of course, anytime that you have um, a sexual assault or similar allegations, there's always the potential for a criminal component. Now, that actually may make a respondent more likely to want to uh, enter into an informal process because they're not having to make public statements and go on the record with what um, they have to say, but at the same time, there also needs to be an understanding of how an informal resolution does not actually affect the criminal process. So even if your parties are agreeing to not speak about something or agreeing to um, not name a person, even if um, the complainant is agreeing to drop the formal complaint at your institution and is agreeing that they won't pursue any kind of um, court action, if a prosecutor wants to go forward with charges against a potential respondent, there is nothing to stop them from subpoenaing your complainant and forcing her or him or they to speak about what occurred. So there does need to be an understanding that the informal resolution is between the parties, but does not actually affect any kind of criminal action that a prosecutor may choose to proceed to proceed with. Um, 
we've talked about this a little bit already, but you should absolutely be having written resolutions with your terms. We'll go through everything that should be included in a bit, but that is um, absolutely important. It needs to be clear and the parties need to see the formal resolution or the informal resolution, but the formal written version before they're signing off on it. Um, and who drafts the resolution? Typically, your facilitator is going to be the one drafting it. The parties are, of course, going to be supplying their terms. You may have a working document that you're both making edits in with the parties and advisors and you're working in while you're doing the process. But the actual final version um, typically would be done by the facilitator. Now, maybe you have two attorneys that are advisors and they agree that one of them is going to draft the final version. Because they're both attorneys, that typically is going to be um, an equal playing field and that's something they can agree to. But if you have advisors that are on unequal playing fields, maybe one's an attorney and one is not an attorney, you should absolutely not be allowing that attorney to draft the resolution um, because that could potentially cause issues with uh, conflicts of interest. So you'll if there's different... Um, if there's an attorney and a non-attorney advisor, the facilitator for the institution should definitely be the one drafting the agreement. Right. And again, you know, this is, if you're not an attorney, you know, a lot of Title IX coordinators are not attorneys. Uh, a lot of people who are handling or are overseeing or facilitating informal resolution, not attorneys, but your college or university has attorneys, you have general counsel. So don't be afraid to reach out to them. Um, you know, they should also be approving any type of informal resolution agreement um, that you're not sure of, you know, the terms um, that that should definitely be a real, real asset and a real, you know, someone to reach out to. Absolutely. And that goes for if there's terms that are going to be included or that the parties want that you have questions about. Maybe you don't know if something is allowed by your university or if you don't know how the university could help facilitate something. Um, go talk to your general counsel. They often will have ideas about what they are comfortable with and with maybe an alternative if there's something that they're not comfortable with. Um, so let's talk about what terms or what items need to be in the written agreement. Your, the terms, as we noted, should be completely fleshed out. As Ashling went through earlier, that includes how they're to be completed and what um, limitations there are on completion. Is there um, a number of sessions with a therapist that someone should be going to? What is the uh, deciding factor on whether a term has been completed? That should be included as well as just the general statement of what's to be done. They should also be discussing confidentiality. Um, if there's going to be a discussion about whether the parties can go and talk about what has occurred, is there going to be a discussion um, or a requirement that names not be used or other identifying factors not be used? Um, that's something that should be included in the agreement. Additionally, dismissing complaints. Um, there may be just one complaint you're dealing with. There may be cross complaints. And both or one or both of those should be addressed. It should also um, be addressed if there's any kind of, like I mentioned earlier, civil court action, if they're going to be dismissing that, that should also be outlined um, within the agreement. We have the note with or without prejudice. Um, that's just a legal term. That means whether they can bring the complaint again. So in most instances, an informal resolution, if the parties both complete the terms that they've agreed to, they um, the complainant or the cross-complainant, if the respondent has brought their own complaint, are generally not allowed to refile that same complaint. Um, of course, that's not including the, the fact of one of them were to breach the informal resolution agreement. That would then, of course, restart the formal process. Um, no contact orders and agreements, which are supportive measures given by the school, but those might also be included in the agreement. Maybe the parties want that to carry on when they're not at school, when they're graduated or left, that should be included. Um, and then the school's role in reviewing. The school should be, like Ashling said, reviewing everything, put it through your general counsel. If you have any questions, definitely get those addressed before everything is finalized and signed off. You don't want anything being questioned afterward. Um, and your school should have best practices for who approves these, right? You might have a general counsel who has a particular person that works closely with the Title IX office. And you also may have additional um, administrators that also want to have a hand in this. So definitely speak to them about who they would like to be having eyes on the agreement before it's finalized. Just wanted to jump in with one of the questions that we received. Is there a monetary limit that can be requested in an informal resolution? Can the payments be for restorative, like for example, medical, or for punitive damages, or is it limited to restorative? 
So it's a good question. Again, you're going to be guided by your own policy. A lot of times, though, you know, these things are outside of the box of your policy. You're not saying, you know, yes, we can accept restorative payments, but not punitive. I mean, those types of wordings anyway are very, you know, legalese and you're kind of envisioning more of a civil complaint. Um, I would say, you know, if it's not against your policy, really, you can be as creative as possible. Um, so when I've dealt with um, agreements that do include money, sometimes the university isn't actually going to look at those terms. Um, so we've had, for example, like a memorandum of understanding between the parties, and then that memorandum just gets incorporated into the terms, into the agreement at the end. So it's it's kind of like the, the, the universities don't want to to oversee the payment of those terms. But again, it's it's all about you know the creative solutions. You know what what can you make happen? What do the parties want to make happen? Does it violate your policy or not? Um, and does the school want to sign off on it or not? Um, if this is going to be the thing that you know gets a very contentious highly publicized case to be informally resolved and and that the parties want to do it that way and the school's okay with it, you know, then there should not be an issue. Great. Thanks, Ashling. And Allison, I think you're going to talk a little bit about being a facilitator from your yes. perspective as a school online coordinator. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so one of the things that I think is really helpful for our Title IX coordinators is to think about the student, right? So they're coming into your office, you may never have met them before, and now they're going to tell you all of these things that have happened to them that they most likely really didn't tell anyone else, right? So have that in your mind. Offer all your options, talk to them about the options, and then come back and when you're having that second meeting, also ask them what they want. Um, when doing this, you'll find that it will answer the, it will help them answer the question of which direction that they want to go to. Um, a lot of times the students really just want their story to be heard by the other person. They want that apology, they the counseling and the education and the training that we've all talked about. Um, and as a Title IX coordinator, you can then help to facilitate the road. It has to be voluntary. I keep saying that today because I think that that's the, another important piece. The, the universities and the institutions can't force this on, on the students. They both have to agree to it. Um, and as the coordinator, it's your job to make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible without any barriers. And so you have to kind of have in the mindset and prepare yourself for each of those interactions and think through what could go wrong. And if that happens, uh, what do I do? So just as you would do action planning with a student, you yourself have to do some action planning um, for all your meetings. Um, if at the first time there's, you know, someone in the office that is not that potted plant from the old days that is causing an issue, then you have to have the, that conversation with them moving forward, that this is not how this is going to work, you know, and you need to protect your students through that process. And that is not an easy thing to do, especially if, uh, you're not an attorney or you're talking to attorneys, but let me tell you, they're, they're all people too, and you'll get through it. So just, uh, you know, think about that. Um, the other the other piece of it is is that be very mindful of the support personnel that the students are bringing in and if they're going to be bringing any additional friends in and making sure that uh, what leaves the the space is conducive right so you want to have those conversations uh, about what that looks like um I think if we go to the next slide I'm doing that one too right yeah so um the the dialogue have ground rules uh, make sure that everybody is um, being clear about what that is um, go in to that facilitated dialogue with you know a plan um, and if the plan starts to kind of go a little haywire which in these cases they sometimes do because it's emotional your responsibility is to sort of pull that back um, for those of you that may want to offer the restorative circles, they are very powerful um, opportunities for students to hear each other. Um, make sure that you're getting the training for that. There's a lot of opportunities for training on how to facilitate that, but I would not go into those without um, 
formal experience in, in that process. There are opportunities to do a combination of those things. Um, and a lot of times those two alternative processes are done without attorneys present. Um, it is typically uh, the student and their support folks, or sometimes just the students and the Title IX coordinator. Um, but the ground rules for those are very, very important. Um, and then obviously we talked a lot about what that negotiated um, agreement is. I will say at any time during this process, I mean, you could be at the end of a facilitated dialogue thinking that it's okay and you can have your respondent or the complainant say, I'm done and walk out and then you're restarting again. And I think that that's the other part of uh, Title IX coordinators action plans is to say, okay, what happens if they wanna stop the process now? What do we do? Um, and that is their right to do so. Um, and we have to sort of take our, our um, sort of, you know, the movement of that is through the, the complaint and what they want um, to do. And I think there was, um, I'm trying to think through what, we had an agreement almost. I, I We were at the point where we're like almost done. I was like, oh goodness, we're, we're almost at the end of this. And then they stopped and it was like, no, I want to go a formal process. I want to hear it. And, and that's completely okay. And I think that's the other thing for Title IX coordinators. It's not our decision on which direction we wanna take or what we think should happen. Our job is to make sure that we're doing the best for the student and what they want. Absolutely, and Allison, let me just jump in there because I've been in that same situation on the attorney advisor side. When that happened to me and we were you know, ready to sign an agreement and, and I heard that the complainant wanted to go back to formal process, I picked up the phone and I called her advisor and I said, what went wrong? You know, what, what can we do? And you know what, we were able to work it out. So again, it's, it's just con continuing that dialogue, you know, as a title nine coordinator, of course, you're not obligated to make that extra step, but again, with, you know, attorney advisors in the mix, I feel like, you know, we're able to, um, you know, make those calls and, and talk about it, uh, you know, at a professional level and really to try to get, um, that informal resolution agreed to. Allison, if you wouldn't mind, so Sydney and I just have the, you know, the background of, of working attorney to attorney, advisor to advisor, but what, practically speaking, what does facilitated dialogue look like to you? I mean, are you in the room with both parties and their advisors? I mean, what does that actually look like? Yeah, thank you, Ash. So that, <laughs> yes. So typically that's set up where the, the two students are coming together and we're going over a list of predetermined um, topics that we're going to discuss. Um, they do talk one, you know, face to face, uh, you know, you're facilitating that discussion. Um, there's a lot of, you know, pulling back and redirecting sometimes because again, it is an emotional thing and, um, you have to be comfortable saying we're not talking about that now and redirecting. And so, again, that's something for talent coordinators to really think through. Are you OK with doing that and, and stopping that at that moment? Um, or do you do you need some training and, and help with that? Um, there are some little things about both this and the restorative circle that I'll tell you. Be very mindful about where you're going to have these discussions. Right. So if your office space allows for this but you're also on a floor that's very noisy and there's a lot of traffic and students know, that, you know that they're only going to the title. You may not want to have it there. You might want to pick a different location that is, you know, quiet and, um, you know, it's just a little bit more, you know, off the beaten path, if you will. Um, you may also want to make sure that you have another staff member available in case something happens. If you think that there's going to be um, you know, a, a need for mental health support afterwards, make sure you have those numbers of the key people um, that you would call. So there's just a, a few things. I mean, the little things about, you know, trauma-informed care that we all think about, about, you know, this way places smell and look, and do you have tissues? And that that's the type of thing that you need to do um, in your own action planning as you prepare for this type of thing. Um, the restorative um, circle is is similar to like a sustained dialogue if you haven't been through that, but that is, um, again, you're kind of working with both parties to come together um, and talk a little bit more freely than the facilitated dialogue. But again, getting to the end point that there's a mutual understanding of how they're going to be on campus and what does traversing the campus look like for them in the moment. And then Again, my practice point here is that you want to look for in the moment and until they're graduating. 
Um, and that could be a series of, you know, days, weeks, months, years. And so what does that look like moving forward? And Sydney, I know you've had a, an experience recently with restorative justice. Would you mind just explaining, you know, how that went for you? Sure, absolutely. So we had a negotiated agreement that then had outlined a restorative justice session between the parties to occur afterward. It was very important in this instance for one of the parties um, to be able to speak freely about um, their experiences, what their long-term effects um, had been, and what their thoughts were just generally about everything that had occurred. Um, and that was something, of course, that the other party stepped in and agreed to do. And so we actually did this over Zoom. In this instance, the advisors were present, but with um, their, of course, everyone's muted. And it was outlined how long each side, um, each party would have to speak, whether there would be questions. In this case, there were not any questions that would be asked. Um, there was not going to be any kind of back and forth or any kind of um, response. This was just an opportunity for them to each be heard. And then afterward, there was a, um, a written response component that was delivered to the Title IX office. And then each party had the opportunity, if they wanted it, to go read whatever the response was. And they could choose to read it or not read it, depending on their preference after everything had occurred. So um, that's also an option if you have parties that maybe they want to negotiate an agreement at an arm's distance, but they do want to have maybe um, a more restorative justice type session afterward. Mm -hmm. I've also had um, parties agree to impact statements um, but that they would not be read in the presence of the other person. So there would be a date set by which the complainant, for example, would submit an impact statement to the Title IX office, and then the respondent was required to go and listen to that orally read to that person um, by a particular date. So that's another way of, you know, again, not putting the parties who, you know, have a no contact order in place and don't want to be in the same room. It's another way of of addressing, you know, impact statements and what they look like. Um, we have a few questions here. There is a question about including a no contact order in the final agreement that outlasts graduation. Um, I have had that happen. And of course you have to explain to the parties, you know, the school doesn't have any enforcement over this. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that the school can do anymore once graduation has occurred. Um, but it really is, I, I think it's just a matter of you want the parties to understand how important this term is um, and that they are going to agree to, you know, not be in the presence of one another. Um, so again, even though there's no real enforcement arm on that, you know, sometimes mentally, emotionally, you know, parties just want that term in there. Um, and so if they agree to it, you know, that that's something certainly that, you know, you, you can still make happen. Um, we also got a question about regarding institutions that are smaller. Is it appropriate for the assigned investigator to undertake the informal resolution um, for matters that are already under investigation? So under the new, the, the anticipated regulations, this cannot happen. Um, you know, currently it can, whether you want it to or not is, is another question. Um, and and the, the con of that is, is that if it doesn't resolve informally and you're going back to the formal investigation, now that same investigator has heard things, you know, during the informal resolution dialogue that perhaps maybe the parties did not want to share or did not want the investigator to know. So that would be my only concern. It's certainly permitted under the regs. It's just, you know, if you have anyone else, I think it's it's better to, to siphon those roles out. Um, so the specifics of the informal resolution, you, you've actually agreed to the terms. Um, where does it go from here and what does it look like? Um, for those involved in ATIXA, there is a toolkit that you can, you know, pull up and utilize if you don't have an example currently. Um, you know, you should speak to the Title IX coordinator, you know, before you or anyone else who has done this before. General Counsel's office may have an agreement, you know, in place that they they like to use. Um, so that that's certainly something that you want to avail yourself of. I mean, really, the goal is is that long after the parties have left the school and you've left the school and everyone involved in this case has left the school, you're going to be able to pick up that agreement and know what the terms were, right? So if there's ever a question five years down the road from now, 10 years down the road from now, 
anyone who's at that institution is going to be able to pull that agreement and know what the terms were. Um, so you really want to give it thought um, as to, you know, the consequences, you know, if, if a party does not abide by the terms, what are the consequences of that? You know, that should be set forth very clearly. Um, the terms of what they've actually agreed to, you know, and bullet point numbered paragraph, you know, make it very simple and very clear. Um, student records, let's think about that. You know, what, what does this look like? Um, where in the student file will this be kept? Um, you know, what if there are any further allegations of misconduct and the student remains on campus? What does that look like? Um, so these are all the, the kind of things that you, you want to be thinking about. Um, you know, sometimes agreements will say this will be, you know, kept and only shared with a very discreet number of people on an as needed basis. For example, if a student is agreeing not to participate, you know, on an athletic team anymore, you know, you have to let the athletic department know that, right? But, um, you know, maybe you want to specify, you know, these are the five people that are going to have knowledge of this agreement. Um, so again, th that there's no concern going forward as to who should be in the know. Any other terms that you want to agree to? A lot of times confidentiality, right? That That's a big one. Um, Non-disparagement, you don't want to have, you know, disparage the other person or, or talk about it um, in a, in a, um, in a way that puts down the other person after the agreement is in place. Um, again, we talked a little bit about no contact agreements and what they look like, um, which is different if the students remain on campus um, versus whether they're either suspended, expelled, or, you know, they've already graduated. Um, again, you want to make that acknowledgement that the terms are entered into voluntarily. Um, so you want that to be one of the terms of the agreement. Um, you want to set forth that this is this is it. You know, this is uh, once this this process has been signed, you know, this particular agreement has been signed, um, that there is not going to be a formal process um, and that there will be no appeal rights. So, again, you want to make this very clear um, what the parties are agreeing to. Um, once that informal resolution agreement has been fully signed, um, you want to send a case closure letter. I just think that's a good practice tip. Um, advise the, the parties in, and provide them with a copy of that fully executed agreement um, so that they they have that sense of closure. And, and again, for a Title IX coordinator coming back in five years saying, oh my gosh, like what is the status of this case? I don't know. All right, they look in the file and they see the case closure letter. Great, it's referencing the agreement. The agreement is attached. Okay, so it's very clear um, what the status of that was. Um, I touched a little bit of, on the memorandum of understanding um, and then the mutual agreement of settlement release. Some schools just do it differently, have different, um, in particular, settlement documents that that can get these done. Um, but again, you you want the terms to be very clear um, and to outlast your relationship with the school. And Allison, I think you're going to talk about yeah, that. I was going, I was like, oh, what am I talking about? Okay. So now, unfortunately, this does happen, right? You go through a, a series of things and it just doesn't happen uh, the way that you envisioned it. Um, and so what do we do then? So then we have to sort of pivot and go to your formal process. And you know, you need to be really clear on what that looks like in your own institutional policy because it is written differently depending on your institution. Um, the regs are there, um, again, just saying that at any time that it can be withdrawn and, and to move to the formal process. Um, you do want this in writing, again, the, that document documentation piece. Um, and then you do need to make sure that you're resending your initial letters out uh, to both both parties. Um, so just you restart. So go back to how your formal process would have been if that was the first choice where you're sending your notice of allegations and notice of charges, and then you set up your investigators. Um, Ashleen touched upon this a little bit. There are often um, pieces of information that you gather during the informal resolution that the regs say you cannot use in a formal process please look at your institutional policies for how your institution says yes or no to that because um, we're in that kind of iffy piece right now. 
Um, and then if the investigation is going to move forward, what does that look like? And I urge you to, to, again, look at thinking about a support personnel and an advisor for both parties, and then making sure that if someone is, has legal representation, what is the institution's obligation then to provide for the other person? So you're really, as a Title IX coordinator, you're, you're stepping all the way back. And, you know, I would say pivot back to as if it was the first time. And, and move forward in that direction. It's, I think, the cleanest um, if you're looking at your processes. Great. And at this point, I know we're at 101, so we are just going to be um, here for another minute or so. But if there's any last questions that people have, I know we've been trying to answer them as they've come up, but we are... Um, able to answer one or two more if there are any. Uh, thank you so much for listening to us today. We hope that you've learned some or have had a little bit more of an understanding why we three at least are huge fans of informal resolution. If you have any questions, um, you can always reach out to us. Uh, I know that this is going to be a presentation that's circulated to all of you. So hopefully if there's anything you missed, you can go back and take a look. And um, if not, then go ahead and you can definitely shoot us an email and all of our contact information is here. Um, so um, here's one last question that I'd like to address. Yes. It's understood that a prosecutor can proceed, but if there is an agreement not to file criminal charges and the complainant does so when no longer part of the educational institution, what implications, if any, would this have for the educational institution? So as part of the informal resolution agreement, you cannot waive your right to bring a criminal case. So that you're never going to be discussing in the informal realm, the criminal side of things. Um, there is definitely, you know, I'm sure you'll be the first one called if a detective gets, uh, you know, a, a case and, and someone files charges against a student. Um, they're going to reach out to you to the Title IX office at your school. Is there a Title IX investigation? What's the investigation? I want to see it. What what was it? What did it entail? So there's definitely going to be um, interplay between the two. But um, as part of the informal resolution, you're never going to be dealing with waiving criminal rights. So I think that's it. We have um, answered all of your questions. And again, reach out to us if you have any in the future. Thank you so much for attending. Yes, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.